Hello and welcome. In this lecture, we're going to be going through an example critique of the Dove campaign for real beauty. And I'm doing this because I think sometimes when we're talking about critiquing film, it's actually helpful to see an example of how that might look. Um, particularly as we're thinking about these different criteria or considerations as we're critiquing film, uh, getting some examples of how that might be expressed might be useful to you going forward. Again, this is a, a framework that was put together by Dr. Berliner and Dr. Kemworthy, um, and it goes through the topics of content, perspective and narr narration, how people are re represented and who's represented, uh, connections that can be made with other uh, sources, uh, the implications of the film, uh, visual elements, the stylistic elements, the sound elements, and the structure or plot. So that's some of the things that we'll be thinking about uh, as we go forward. So first off, um, the Dove, Dove Campaign for Real Beauty is uh, a really strong example of what we call social marketing. So social marketing is an approach that's being used more frequently nowadays to uh, essentially take uh, an issue uh, or a topic that relates to a specific product and cast it in a favorable light with respect to uh, social goods so that the brand itself is connected to some sort of social um, benefit uh, that comes from it. So you see that commonly in uh, what we call green marketing, for example. So certain products that are uh, supposed to be more environmentally friendly. Um, and uh, these, these types of campaigns are typically geared around raising goodwill among the public towards their brand, uh, potentially also providing real benefits to the community if, if their marketing is something that is beneficial, or that, that, that would be the argument. Um, and it often relies on the idea that people will support and share and, uh, and provide free promotion essentially for their brand in sort of uh, in recognition of the work that they're trying to do or that they say that they're trying to do. Now, this approach is somewhat controversial and part of this controversy is due to the fact that these efforts are tied to commercial gain typically. And um, some people would argue, well, that's fine. Um, it's okay to make some money if you're also doing good and you know that those two can work together. Uh, in fact, uh, by some views, companies can have tremendous power to make social project pro progress. And we've actually seen some really impressive examples of that. Um, but there's other points of view which are skeptical of this. If that marketing doesn't go perfectly or if it uh, expressed contradictory points of view, um, or it seems to be hiding something about what the company is actually doing, well, these approaches can be actually pretty controversial. So just to say a few words about the Dove campaign for real beauty, uh, this is a campaign that's been going for well over a decade. Um, and it came out of Dove being increasingly interested in how th they could uh, address women's perceptions of beauty and how, uh, and particularly an interest in the idea of broadening the perspective uh, in terms of what counts as being beautiful uh, for women internationally. So um, what they did is they did some research, uh, you know, product research and research on the opinions of their target, target audience. And what the research suggested was that there was actually um, a fair amount of negative body image uh, expressed by women, uh, a lack of willingness to see oneself as being beautiful, uh, and also some anger and dissatisfaction at social pressures to be beautiful in certain ways. Uh, and sometimes that was directed towards companies as well. So they hired an agency, Olgvi and uh, Mather, um, who worked with them to create uh, the Dove Campaign for Real Beauty, which launched in 2004. Okay, so we're about to watch uh, one of their ads that they put together, a short film. Um, but before we do, uh, as we're thinking about the practice of going through critique, maybe you might want to think and review the key considerations for critique, just to remind yourself that before you, before you view the video. Um, as you're viewing the video, pay close attention to what the major themes are that are coming out and what's being said, uh, any emotions that you might be having in response to the film, and uh, what content is shown and what content isn't shown. 
Now, what might be helpful is actually taking notes using this framework or just generally taking notes on things that you notice as you're watching the film. Now, if you want, you can take a second to just do those things um, uh, and stop the video and go forward. But um, I'm going to start up in a second and uh, we'll be watching a short video. This video is called uh, The Dove Real Beauty Sketches. I always thought people were so cute and they have the little cheeks and they're like rosy, but mine are pretty plain. If I was going to change one feature about my face, I would say that I would want fuller lips. I'm definitely a person that looks tired when I'm tired, and when people say that, I immediately am like, oh man. I'm starting to already get little crow's feet and stuff, which like my mom has, so yeah. I'm a forensic artist. I was trained at the FBI Academy in 1993 in composite art. Worked for the San Jose Police Department as the police artist from 1995 to 2011. We didn't really know what we were doing, so that was nerve-wracking for everyone. I showed up to a place I had never been and walked into this big warehouse, and at the very end there was a guy with his back to me with a drafting board. I had a curtain separating me so that I don't see him. Uh, we'll begin. First of all, tell me about your hair. Uh, brown, long, I guess a little bit past my shoulders. Your jaw? My mom told me I had a big jaw. Yeah, they're brown eyebrows, dark brown eyebrows. Okay. I didn't know what he was doing, but then I could tell after several questions that he was drawing me. Tell me about your chin. I guess I haven't really compared it to anyone else's chin, but um, especially when like I smile, I just feel like it kind of protrudes a little bit. Hmm. What would be your most prominent feature? I kind of have a fat, rounder face. The older I've gotten, the more freckles I've gotten. You sort of realize, oh man, now I, I have to talk about myself and, and, and think about my looks. I'm 40, so I'm starting to get a little bit of the crow's feet thing going on. Um. Once I get a sketch, I say thank you very much, and then they leave. I don't see them. I still didn't know. All I had been told before the sketch was to get friendly with this other woman, Chloe. Today I'm going to ask you some questions about a person you met earlier, and I'm going to ask you some general questions about their face. She was thin, so you could see her cheekbones. And her chin was a nice, thin chin. Mm. The women were really critical about moles or scars or things like that. And yet, they were describing just a normal, beautiful person. She had nice eyes. They lit up when she spoke and were very expressive. The length of the nose, what is that like? A short. Short. Yeah, cute nose. Her face was fairly thin. She had blue eyes, very nice blue eyes. Okay. So here we go. Hmm. So this is your self-described image. And then somebody else described you and I did this sketch. This whole thing about having dark circles and crow's feet around my eyes and that was not part of the sketch at all that the stranger did. The stranger's was a little more like gentle. That's really different. She looks closed off and fatter. She just looks kind of shut down. Looks sadder, too. The second one is more beautiful. You think they're catching more of that from you? Yeah. yeah, yeah. 
She looks more open and um, friendly and happy. I've come a long way in how I see myself, but I think I still have oh, some way to go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> have some work to do on myself. Do you think you're more beautiful than you say? Yeah. Yeah. Chloe's perception was so, so clearly different. Her picture looked like somebody I thought I would want to talk to and be friends with, like a happy, light, much younger, much brighter person. It's troubling. I should be more grateful of my natural beauty. It impacts the choices in the friends that we make, the jobs we apply for, how we treat our children. It impacts everything. It couldn't be more critical to your happiness. Our self-perceptions are generally kind of harsh and unbecoming when really that's not how the world sees us. We spend a lot of time as women analyzing and trying to fix the things that aren't quite right. And we should spend more time appreciating the things that we do like. So now that we've watched that video, what do you think about it? Uh, it's sometimes helpful for you to actually sit down and think what, what your perspective is before you hear other people's critiques, right? Uh, so that will give you a point of comparison and you can also see how your views change. So you might want to stop this and take a, a few seconds to think about what are your attitudes towards this, towards this video. All right, so I'm gonna move forward and I'm gonna talk about my a critique of this video. Um, again, all critiques have elements that are subjective and you can feel free to disagree with my analysis of this. And that conversation is also sort of how we come to a better understanding of what the pros and cons of, of a piece of media are. Um, again, what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and point out some of the strengths and some of the weaknesses in going forward. Now, I'll also note, as I uh, put this together, I did do some reading to think about, learn a little bit about the background for Dove and this campaign. Uh, and there were a couple articles, one that sort of looked at the business side to this with uh, Unilever, uh, and another that sort of talked about some of the criticisms that have been expressed around this campaign ad that, um, that were helpful in forming this. And there's information there if you want to read more. All right, so again, I'm gonna walk through the, the nine different elements of critique in, in sort of my assessment of this. All right, so first off, what was the content like in this video? Well, um, I actually thought it was pretty concise. So they actually packed a lot in there. Um, I didn't feel like there was much information that was extraneous, that if you had pulled it out, it wouldn't have made it any difference. Um, however, I did see some things that I thought perhaps were missing. So we missed information, for example, about that initial setup where the uh, participant talked to the stranger. So it's a little hard to understand exactly what happened there and how much the stranger actually knew and con how, how they connected to the participant uh, in the project. I'll also note when we're talking about the, the, the content of this video, it's not a data-based sort of presentation. It's mostly subjective. Uh, it's about conveying people's own voices. And, um, you know, when people convey, speak in their own voices, there's a certain element of authenticity there and storyline, which is actually valuable. Uh, you know, you of course don't know what information has been cut though. We do know that other interviews and portraits were cut. So, uh, we didn't see all the participants in this, in this project in the actual film that was created. So we don't know, for example, how accurately the, the video that is created actually reflects all the content that they might have collected. Um, we also see that there's some indications that there may be biases uh, among the people who made this, uh, but we'll talk a little bit more about that later. 
So when we think about perspective and narration, here we're thinking about what viewpoint was conveyed and how was it conveyed through the narration in the film. So uh, first off, you might think about who is sort of behind the scenes in creating this film, right? Uh, you can see, you think about the, the, what's being said in the film itself. You can also think about the why and the who of the actual creation. And, you know, this was created by Dove. Uh, you know, I, you know, there is indication certainly in what they've talked about that suggests honorable intent in creating this. But it's also important to note that this is also connected to marketing and the realities of financial pressure pressures for an organization. So uh, having that perspective as a commercial product as well as a social endeavor is an important one for, for analyzing this piece of media. Um, when we're thinking about not sort of the behind the scenes, but who's actually in the frame, who's actually being viewed, um, the primary focus of this is people who are being interviewed. Um, now, what's interesting about it is uh, it sounds and, and, and so a lot of the attention is sort of paid to the to the women who are interviewed in this. But actually, in many ways, the central perspective of this ad, from my point of view, was actually the male forensic artist. Um, and you can partially see that in a few different there's a few different indicators to that to me. One is he was set up as, a, as an expert. They spent some time presenting him as having credentials. Right. He also did a lot of work to sort of, he was the one who was kind of the arbiter of what counts as beauty, right? So it was his interpretations that were deemed beautiful or not beautiful. He did a lot of state, made a lot of statements about beauty, about how people actually have a lot of beauty in multiple ways. And then he was asking questions of the women to sort of guide them towards certain interpretations of beauty uh, that, that he had. And so there, there was a sort of framing, a gendered framing around the, the dialogue around what beauty is. Um, and I think that that's notable in, in this case in terms of the perspective that was featured, uh, especially because it wasn't necessarily clear that that was sort of an organizing perspective in the film uh, from my point of view. Um, there was also the female, uh, the female participants who were, um, also focused on in the film. And, uh, this was an important part of the film as well. Um, but what's interesting is that the whole point of the film was to shift their perspective, not to take their perspective as given, but to take it as something that would be changed through the, the, the perspective offered in the, in the film and the exercise that was conducted. Um, there was also strangers and their perspective that was offered in the film. And, and this was kind of interesting because their perspective was presented as being, quote unquote, objective. Like they were the gold standard in terms of really seeing who somebody is. And that's kind of an interesting uh, factor because they only met this person for a short period of time. Why do we think that they are just because they're a stranger that they're necessarily objective? And would there be in this context an interest in actually presenting a more positive viewpoint? Um, I, I just think that that's sort of interesting about the, the ways in which these perspectives were, were viewed. Um, and again, as mentioned before, they were missing perspectives. So we didn't see, there were a lot of people interviewed in this. We only saw a subset. Um, I think it's worth noting that w the representation in this film was not entirely representative of the general public, right? So uh, the featured voices, um, there were primarily four women who were presented. They were all uh, typically younger. I think the oldest person was about 40 years old. Um, they were all white. Um, and um, there wasn't a whole lot of body diversity presented in, in, that, in that imagery, right? So the, the film itself may not have actually re represented a wide range of individuals. Uh, now, why did they do this? Well, we don't know exactly. Maybe it's they, it was a commercial decision where they decided this is the target audience I want to go for, and they pick people based on that. It could be that what was said or the way that was structured actually best supported the narrative that they wanted to convey, which is that, you know, strangers uh, view people more favorably than they view themselves, right? Um, or it could just be the content provided by those individuals was more rich in certain ways. Um, we don't really, we just don't know what happened there. Um, we do know that um, 
there were a range of different people of color who were actually interviewed for this and were part of this project. So we saw that there were actually a few of them. They only had about 10 seconds of screen time during this video. Um, and we don't know, again, why the choice was made that they were not included in, in the, the feature, the, the film that was combined, combined there. Um, and so that raises a question, what were their biases in terms of the choices that were made? I think another way to view this video is to think about connections. So um, I think you could uh, connect this video to uh, academic work, uh, for example. So you could think about how this relates to different concepts around body image, for example, that, that we know about. Um, you could also think about historical comparisons. So this, this video, I think, uh, shines relatively favorably, in my point of view, uh, compared to historical uh, ads that were put out by, by Dove or other cosmetics or, or beauty products agencies in the sense that um, it wasn't geared or intended to focus on certain types of beauty or thin ideals, right? Um, so this is actually a fairly substantial and dramatic shift from typical presentations of women and the types of content and emotions and consideration that was given in this film and, you know, intention of having respect in it. And um, I think from that point of view, it has historical and, you know, current sort of current perspective importance uh, in terms of the impact that it had on the fil fil uh, field of uh, social marketing uh, and how we think about what is possible when it comes to uh, conveying, uh, talking about these types of things uh, from a commercial lens. Um, I think that there's another way to view this, and this is uh, this is a comparison and a connection that I want to make that really looks at marketing, right? So this is uh, looking critically at the fact that Dove is a company, right? And it's a company that's part of the Unilever Corporation. So it's uh, connected to a range of other types of products. Uh, which uh, are managed collaboratively, collaboratively by Unilever. And uh, Unilever actually has a decent amount of control over what's produced. They do, they, they do see different uh, brands as having the, uh, some, some independence, but they have central marketing imperatives and expectations and relationships. Um, now, Unilever also oversees Axe. Uh, which is a uh, deodorant and other product brand that is fairly aggressively targeted towards men, particularly young men. Um, now, this is a, uh, a company that produced uh, another ad campaign uh, called the Boom Chickawawa campaign. And um, I think that it's kind of interesting to look at as a point of comparison uh, to look at some of these market imperatives that come out in social marketing uh, in terms of those relationships that occur. And also, I think, as an example of how different marketing campaigns can be. Uh, in some ways, this might emphasize uh, perhaps successes of the Dove, Dove campaign. So let's uh, take a look at that ad. Hi, Danny. Hi. Danny? My dad. Hey, it's yeah. nice to meet you. Muito prazer. Muito prazer. Can I use your bathroom? It's right down the hall. Excuse me. This, uh... Bow, bow, wow! Wow! We've improved all the fragrances. New acts now with added. All right. So we saw two different ads. So when we're thinking about this market comparison sort of view uh, from a content perspective in terms of what was conveyed and the style in which it was conveyed, the two ads couldn't be more different, right? Um, now, remember, in some ways, this sort of reminds us of how unusual the Dove ad is, right? So it can be seen as a favorable comparison from that perspective. Um, now, the the Axe ad is actually kind of interesting in its own right. So it's an ad that is very 
much intended to be humorous, right? It's also very tongue in cheek. Um, so it's actually knowingly playing with uh, sort of tropes around sexuality uh, with the audience. And it, it's, it's aware that the audience is sort of in on this joke, right? And uh, presumably a fair number of people found that quite funny. Um, it's also deliberately talking about sexuality. So the whole, uh, one of Axe's primary sort of marketing approaches is sort of boy gets girl kind of storylines. And that's pretty consistent across their advertising. And um, this is an ad where, you know, you see very deliberate use of sexuality with that with that intent. Um, now, there's multiple ways you could view this. You could take a sort of postmodern approach where you sort of, you could say, you know, because it was knowingly uh, cheeky, right? Uh, and uh, it sort of had an unusual take. It sort of did flip a script in the sense that it presented a woman in a more sexually aggressive uh, uh, perspective, which is actually fairly rare uh, on the whole. Uh, you could argue that it might be a potential have empowering points of view. That would not be my argument. Um, my argument would say essentially, uh, although there was that element of things, it was done in the context of a woman being put in a situation where they became out of control, where they actually weren't deliberative and they became a sexual beast, right? Uh, and uh, that, that this was due to this product. And uh, this sort of fits in with uh, some tropes around uh, male sexual fantasies, etc. So um, I, I th find it hard to argue that this is actually an empowering sort of perspective on things. Uh, but it's sort of, it's an interesting take that's worthy of its own analysis, which uh, I'm not going to do here. Um, now, what's interesting is that these two ads are just very, very different uh, in terms of content and style. However, what's kind of fascinating about it is actually from a business point of view, the two ads were actually the same, right? The, set, the ads were wildly successful. They both made Unilever a ton of money. Um, and they were even won, both of them won awards. Like ads from both of these campaigns were in the top 10 ads from the year. So a uh, major success for Unilever and made them a ton of money. So uh, the point here is that from a certain market point of view, maybe, you know, one could argue maybe there isn't a difference in terms of the actual, you know, social value intent of these ads. Uh, and that depends on whether you want to focus in on Unilever and its overall market practices, or you want to focus on individual band, uh, brands independently, which probably had members of their teams that did have different intentions. So it's something interesting to think about here as a point of comparison. Um, so I think that another way to analyze this is thinking about what the implications of this video are. So what are the, what is the overall message? Well, the overall message that's trying to be conveyed by this video is that women are typically, typically too hard on themselves and their appearance, and they tend to have too negative of a view towards themselves. Uh, it also is saying that other people really think we're great. They think that we're beautiful and lovely and that we, we, we have this sort of mistaken view or women have this mistaken view. It's, it's gendered. Um, and uh, one of the points also is that we need to be better at sort of building our appreciation for ourself and uh, building our self-confidence, right? So that's, that's sort of the message that's being conveyed in the film. Uh, and that's what they're trying to say with it, or that's my interpretation of it. Now, there's other sort of takes on that that I think are somewhat more critical of this perspective or this attempt to sort of uh, shift viewpoints and produce change. So uh, first off, it's kind of interesting that this is, this is the campaign, campaign for real beauty. And that raises the question of what is real beauty, right? Um, or natural beauty, right? Uh, is it something, are we saying that someone who is really artistic and uses cosmetics, for example, and changes their appearance, and that happens to meet uh, societal beliefs about uh, attractivity, uh, how attractive somebody is, is that fake? Is that not real? Is that not valuable, right? Uh, so so the statement about real actually carries some weight and uh, has social implications, right? Um, the other thing about the ad that's kind of interesting is that instead of, potentially, instead of undermining beauty as a standard, it actually reinforces beauty as a standard. 
uh, it clearly sees it as being a primary value, right? So uh, at the end of the ad, for example, uh, there's a statement along the lines of beauty is critical. Seeing ourselves as beautiful is critical to our happiness, right? Uh, it's a critical thing. It's really important. And the video itself really relies extensively on comparisons between individuals. So people are say, comparing themselves uh, in some cases, they're comparing themselves to the viewpoints per portrayed in the in the drawings, uh, but it's very much about how people view so, so themselves, their bodies, and it really engages a lot of the concepts that we're thinking about in terms of social comparison theory, uh, uh, social comparison theory, uh, up comparisons and down comparisons, or uh, you know self schema theory, where you know people might have schemas that are about their the attraction um, and desirability and that that might be a frame that's been used in this film to produce certain types of things. But clearly the film is reinforcing the point that women are supposed to be beautiful. And you see that in part when, when the women in the film are comparing, they're talking about how unattractive one of those images is. Uh, and well, the, some of those, the images that are self-described, I, they're not necessarily unattractive. And there's certainly people who, who uh, have that, who look like that, right? So uh, in some way, it's reinforcing the idea that people should look in a certain way um, fairly subtly. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting about it is the solution that they offer, uh, and multiple speakers in the film essentially say this, is I should be gentler on myself or kinder on myself, or I should, uh, you know, I should do work to, you know, view myself more favorably, right? So it's offering up an individual solution to a societal or systemic problem that's partially due to the media, right? Uh, and advertising industry, et cetera, right? So instead of the target of this being uh, those societal shifts, the target is for people to feel differently about how they are existing in that society, right? Um, so that's, that's kind of controversial. Um, now, when we're also thinking about implications, we're also thinking about what change did this produce? Well, there's uh, good indications that this actually might have had significant imp impacts. So we're seeing millions of views, uh, many millions of views. So this, this video, I think, has 9 million views um, across the Dove campaign that they, they did. Uh, I saw an estimate of uh, over 200 million views of their campaign. Um, they also had a lot of people sharing this, were millions and millions of people sharing this within their social network. They also got a huge amount of free publicity. So they were invited onto um, talk shows and uh, radio. And uh, this was a really uh, popular ad that people gathered a lot of attention. And um, they actually did some estimates that they, they got about something like $150 million in free advertising from that free publicity that they got through this. Um, and uh, one estimate is that they got, they spent about, got about 30 times for one of the cameras, they got about 30, 30 times the amount of publicity that they actually spent for, that, that they would have had to spend for. So um, really, um, really effective. They, they did reach a lot of people with this. And uh, uh, a lot of people felt very emotionally in response to this. So there's, a lot of indications that um, it was successful in terms of impacting people. So uh, there is data suggesting that there was uh, popularity, growth in popularity for their brand uh, and increased brand loyalty as a result of this. So uh, fairly notable in terms of the impact that this potentially could have had. All right, so um, when we're talking about form visual, visual elements, we're thinking about how the film was set up to show the material that they're covering. Um, so most of the film typically used fairly narrow perspectives. So they were typically focusing in in sort of portrait shots on people as they're talking. So fairly narrow, and that was intentional, right? Um, this narrow focus, you also see it in the framed uh, drawings, for example, were really intended to focus in on the features of the people in the film and pay attention to their experiences of this. And um, these, this emphasis on physical features actually really invited 
comparison by the audience. It invited the audience to sort of say, okay, how is this matching up in terms of what they're saying with what their actual, you know, my interpretation of their features are. And there's ways in which by talking about noses or eyebrows or other components, there's a bit of fragmentation going on, which is the theme that we see sometimes in, in advertisements and, and gendered presentations. So fragmentation of the body and compo looking at parts of the body and assessing this. And this is important for thinking about body image, right? Because they actually did some research to see how these Dove ads impacted people. And uh, some of the experimental data where they compared Dove ads to uh, ads that focused on sort of thin ideal images, both of them left people with negative perceptions around body image, right? Uh, suggesting that maybe the goal of this film, at least in the short term, did not succeed, right? Uh, that being said, maybe in the long term, the ideas and concepts around this might have been more powerful. So I think, I think that's an open question in terms of what the impact was overall. Um, there's also sort of a visual trick that's worth noting, which is that they set us up so that we could see both the artist and the artist, what the artist is drawing, and the person who is sitting there behind the screen. So it, that's a perspective trick that they use to try and give us insight into the story that has implications for the plot and sort of the story trajectory. Um, when we're thinking about the style of the film, um, my sense of that style was that it was fairly warm and inviting. Uh, it used some sort of artsy elements. Uh, it was very personal and generally welcoming. Um, it also had sort of a stylistic element that because of that artsiness that was, I felt kind of it, like it was a little bit introspective. They did use a range of different styles uh, and lighting. So some, some high contrast lighting, they used a lot of soft focus, for example. Uh, they, uh, um, you know, they had some with uh, substantial distortions. But my sense of the film is that it was actually pretty successful. I thought it came well together, particularly, particularly given the fact that they had many, many cuts in this film. To tell their story, they chopped it up a lot. And, uh, you know, there were maybe 50 different cuts in that film, yet they managed to tell, I thought, a very smooth, cohesive, cohesive story. So in, in, from my point of view, very successful in that sense. Um, I also think that the choices overall that they made with the style really uh, aligned well with the emotional components that they were trying to convey. So successfully, try, uh, successfully uh, engaged emotional sort of feelings in that tone that they set. You could also think about sound elements. Uh, so, uh, you know, most of the sound was really focused in on the voice. Uh, the voice was typically fairly clear narration. Sometimes it was direct from people uh, and sometimes it was a voiceover. Again, remember when it comes to voice, there were some voices that weren't heard in this film. So that's notable in that sense. Um, I would also say that the music was, I think, a very important part to setting the feeling of the film. Um, there was music throughout uh, in the background. Uh, it was, I would describe it as being sensitive, like it, it invoked sort of a sensitive feel. It was emotional. I think particularly at the beginning, it was actually sad. So when women were talking about how they were critical of themselves, it was a fairly sad feeling. Uh, as it moved on, it, it became more atmospheric. So there's a bit of a transition throughout the film. Um, but I think it was an important part to the, the emotional tenor of that film. Uh, structure and plot. So I think that this film actually was pretty careful in terms of the plot that it revealed. It was, it, it, it was very tight and it built up tension because you didn't really know what was happening and they sort of did multiple reveals throughout it to keep your attention. Um, it told a very specific story that became very clear. And the narrative throughout it was essentially telling you what to think. Uh, it was providing you with interpretation for you. Um, what's interesting about it is because of the flow and because of how concise it was, there wasn't a lot of opportunity for the viewer to question this. And you can imagine that this story could have been told very differently. For example, they could have said, we're going to do this experiment where we're going to set this up and we're going to see what the impact is. And, you know, here's a consideration, here's our hypothesis, uh, and here's our results, here's what we found. Well, that would have been very different uh, in terms of the impact because that would have given the viewer say, hmm, what would we see here? Well, we might see some things in this way, some things in the other. I don't know. Let's see and test and, and proceed through this. So uh, the fact that we were sort of drawn through this 
uh, really, that flow really led us to make certain types of conclusions from this story. And I think fairly clearly and effectively illustrated those, those points of view uh, that were the major implications of the film. Um, so what are my overall perspectives on this? Well, you know, my overall critique is I actually think that there are some pretty significant challenges with this. I think, you know, the commercial incentives that were involved in here and what they meant and sort of the contradictions that we see here are pretty no noteworthy uh, and worth highlighting. Um, you know, some issues with um, representation, um, some uh, uh, some issues with what the underlying messages were around really emphasizing beauty as being a key factor here, um, uh, where, you know, it kind of undermines some of what they're trying to do. Um, that being said, I think it's when we think about also emphasizing some of the positives of this, I actually think that this is actually a historical, historically important campaign. Uh, if you look at writings about uh, social marketing, about uh, body image, about uh, the role of media uh, in gender and body image, this is one of the campaigns that are most famous uh, for attempting to change, shift the dialogue around this. Uh, and effectively conveying those messages. So I think that what it did do that is really worth emphasizing is that I think it really did change the conversation and our vision for what could be possible in marketing. So, um, you know, those are some of the things that uh, I found interesting about it. Um, as you think about using a framework to analyze video, um, all those different elements will give us insight into different components of the film. Now, I chose to emphasize certain ones more than other because I found them more interesting and more revealing. And that's okay. You know, you can have some being a major component part and others can be more of a mention in terms of the role that it played in the film. But, um, you know, you can choose which ones you think are most uh, most valuable in terms of understanding what a, a piece of media is conveying. So again, uh, we have a range of different ways of doing this. Uh, I hope that this example was helpful for giving you some insight into how you might take a piece of media and parse it out. Uh, so I think it's actually really kind of an interesting and fun process to, to do that. I, I enjoy doing this project and I hope that you enjoy doing similar work yourself. So uh, thank you very much for listening uh, and take care, everyone.